One of the most distinctive features of proton NMR spectra is that signals show up with multiple subpeaks, and these subpeaks tend to have patterns in the peak heights, going from, for example, relatively low on the outsides to relatively high in the middle. Subpeaks are due to an NMR phenomenon known as coupling. And the fundamental idea underlying coupling is that the magnetic field that a proton experiences is influenced by the spin states of its neighbors, whether the neighboring nuclear spins are parallel to or anti-parallel to the external magnetic field B0. And the two spin sets of nuclear spins influence each other on neighboring carbons, and so we say they're coupled to each other. Now, how coupling actually works in practice is nearby nuclear spins have to be either parallel or anti-parallel, right? Either alpha or beta. So we can imagine a situation, for instance, where we have two hydrogens in kind of a one-two relationship. This is what we're going to call vicinal further down below. And say we're interested in the signal associated with this hydrogen. It has one neighbor on the carbon next door. And what we observe is a splitting of that signal for that hydrogen into two peaks, what we'll call in the future a doublet. Those peaks are separated by a gap in chemical shift and a gap in precession frequency. And this gap is due to the two possible spin states of the neighboring hydrogen in red. That hydrogen could have the alpha spin state, in which case the um, precession frequency and the chemical shift is pushed in one direction, or the beta spin state, in which case the chemical shift is pushed in the opposite direction. And so the presence of this one neighboring hydrogen to this blue hydrogen splits that hydrogen into what we call a doublet, two signals. Now, this gap between the subpeaks has a frequency value in hertz corresponding to the gap in frequency between the two peaks. This is what's known as the coupling constant, J. And it's measured in units of hertz for reasons we'll touch on in a second. There are two ways that hydrogens can be neighbors and couple to each other that are um, the focus of the bottom half of this slide. There's the situation we just looked at, the vicinal situation, where two hydrogens are linked to carbons that are linked to each other. So hydrogens in a kind of one-two relationship. In this situation, what we observe for the two hydrogens is that they both split into doublets. For example, the signal for HA is a doublet that looks like this, and the signal for HB, maybe it's a little bit upfield, a little bit more shielded, also looks like a doublet. And the two protons split each other with the same coupling constant. So there's a coupling constant, JAB, we might say the splitting of the A signal by the B proton. And there's a coupling constant, JBA, the splitting of the B signal by the A proton. And these two are equal to each other. And this is one of the very powerful aspects about coupling. We can recognize, for example, an identical gap between these two peaks and recognize that these two hydrogens are coupled to each other, meaning that they have a vicinal relationship. They are linked to carbons that are linked to each other. This is how we get connectivity information from coupling, one of the ways we can do so. We can also use multiplicity, as we'll see here a little bit later. It's also possible for two diastereotopic protons linked to a common carbon to couple with each other in what we call a geminal arrangement. The geminal situation is two hydrogens, HA and HB, linked to a common carbon, so a kind of 1-1 one -one relationship here. And these hydrogens can be diastereotopic when the molecule has a stereocenter in it somewhere. So for example, something like this, where we have this stereocenter, this phenyl ring makes HA and HB distinct from each other, right? They're gonna have different chemical shifts depending on which one is closer to the phenyl ring versus farther away, right? So we've made these two protons different and they're able to couple with each other and the exact same ideas apply as in the vicinal case. HB's possibility of being alpha or beta is going to split the HA signal into two subpeaks, and HA's possibility of being alpha or beta is going to split the HB signal into two subpeaks, and the width of that splitting is equal for the two signals since these two protons are coupling to each other. So again, we have a JAB, the splitting of the HA signal by the B protons, and we have a JBA, the splitting of the B signal by the A protons, and these two coupling constants are equal to each other. So this is coupling, gives us some profound structural information about how carbons are connected to each other in organic compounds 
when coupling shows up in a proton NMR spectrum. Coupling is a fundamentally molecular phenomenon. It doesn't exactly depend on the NMR experiment in any profound way. For example, it doesn't depend on the magnetic field strength. Coupling constants are intrinsic to the molecular structure and how close in space and how the electron densities around two protons are related. For this reason, the coupling constant doesn't vary by instrument. It is a fixed value in Hertz for a fixed compound. And so coupling constants are reported in units of Hertz, absolute frequency as opposed to chemical shift. Their values in chemical shift units in parts per million do depend on operating frequency, and the lower the operating frequency, the closer these get in ppm. And so subpeaks can actually mush out when we use instruments with low operating frequency. This is one reason we're interested in pushing to higher and higher operating frequencies so that we don't miss out on coupling. In very old spectra, for example, if you go back to the 1960s, you'll see spectra where we would expect subpeaks, we would expect coupling, but all you see is like a broad, mushy signal because we can't discern subpeaks because of the low uh, resolution of the instrument in Hertz. Now, we just noted that coupled sets of protons exhibit equal coupling constants. If the coupling of, for example, this hydrogen to this hydrogen is 7 hertz, the coupling of this hydrogen to this hydrogen is also 7 hertz. So those coupling constants are equal, and this allows us to identify hydrogens that have a vicinal or geminal relationship. In the bottom half of this slide, you get a sense of typical coupling constants, 6 to 8 hertz, for a 1-2 kind of dialkyl situation for alkyl protons, and so on and so forth. I won't belabor these. One thing worth noting that we're not going to touch on in detail here, but you may encounter if you run spectra of aromatic compounds in the future, is that benzenes can exhibit long-range coupling between hydrogens that are farther away than vicinal, right? This is a 1-3 relationship, and these coupling constants can be between 1 and 3 hertz. Here it's called four-bond coupling. It's often called long-range coupling as well. Because of the pi electrons in the benzene ring, we can see a uh, coupling over this relatively long range for benzene rings. Not something we're going to touch on in detail, though. We've seen how coupling gives rise to a doublet when one neighboring proton with two possible spin environments, alpha or beta, gives rise to two subpeaks. When we have more than one neighboring proton, more than one equivalent neighboring proton, we can get more subpeaks in a signal. The number of subpeaks in a signal is known as its multiplicity. And typically we use terms ending in ET to represent multiplicity. So singlet is a multiplicity of one, no coupling at all. Doublet, we've seen previously. Triplet, multiplicity of three. Quartet, four. Quintet, five. Sextet, six. Septet, seven, etc., etc., etc. And multiplicity depends on the number of protons coupled to the protons corresponding to the signal of interest. And there's a simple rule when we're talking about one set of equivalent protons that we'll see here in a second to see how this works. But we're actually going to look at the cases of one, two, and three neighboring protons in detail to get a sense of how multiplicity comes about. So the one neighboring proton case we've already looked at. I'm just putting it here just for sort of completeness. So Hb is a neighboring proton to Ha. With one neighboring proton, that neighboring proton could be aligned against the field, beta, or with the field, alpha. And this gives rise to two possible spin environments. And so we see a doublet corresponding to those two possible spin environments for the neighboring Hb proton. When there are two neighboring protons, as in this case where we have two, let's call them chemically equivalent HBs for the purpose of this example, that couple to HA. Now in fact there are actually three possible spin environments based on the two nuclear spins. Both could be against the field, that's shown here. One with and one could be one could be with and one could be against the field, those are shown here, and these will give equivalent chemical shifts, and so they'll sort of overlap they're just twice as likely as the other two possibilities, or both protons' spins could be aligned with the field. So three possible spin environments here, and sure enough in the signal we see a triplet. And the middle subpeak has a higher height than the outer two peaks because it's twice as likely to appear based on these two possible nuclear spin arrangements giving the same chemical shift. When we have three neighboring signals, we have a case where we end up with a quartet because the three neighboring HBs 
give rise to four possible spin environments. And they're shown for you here. We can sort of group them and concisely talk about them as saying, okay, I have three spins all aligned against the field, three spins all aligned with the field. I've got one width and two against, and I've got two width and one against, and these will all be associated with different chemical shift values. And notice these two in the middle are three times as likely as the two on the outside, just due to the spin statistics here, which is why we see this one to three to three to one pattern in a quartet. Now, what all three of these examples have shown us, one, two, and three neighboring protons, is that the number of possible spin environments and the number of subpeaks is one more than the number of neighboring protons. For example, in the case of two neighbors, two neighbors gives rise to three subpeaks. This leads to a rule for neighboring protons that allows us to predict multiplicity based on the number of equivalent protons in a neighboring set. This is known as the n plus one rule. The number of subpeaks in a signal is equal to the number of chemically equivalent neighboring protons plus one. If I've got one neighbor, two subpeaks, double it. Two neighbors, three subpeaks, that's a triplet. Three neighbors, four subpeaks, that's a quartet, so on and so on and so forth. Now, that said, the n plus one rule only works when there is one and only one set of equivalent neighboring protons. When you have multiple distinct sets of protons with different chemical shifts, then we're going to get more complex splitting patterns that we'll touch on here in a second. But the n plus one rule works very well if you have only one neighboring set of protons. We'll also learn that when you have a complex splitting pattern, you can apply the n plus one rule, but you have to do it multiple times and use a splitting tree to visualize what's going to happen to the signal. In this problem, we're asked to determine the multiplicity of each signal in the expected proton NMR spectrum of this compound. And this is going to be a two-step process drawing on skills we've seen previously. First, we need to determine the numbers and types of signals in the proton NMR spectrum, looking for qu chemically equivalent sets of protons. And then we're going to apply the n plus 1 rule to each of those sets of protons, looking at the neighbors, looking specifically at the visceral neighbors, one carbon over, to determine the multiplicity of each signal. So let's start just by laying down all of the implied hydrogens. And I've done this here here. If this is unclear, it's worth pausing the video and making sure that we've taken account of all the implied hydrogens here. Now next, we want to look for chemical equivalence. For example, we know all of the CH3 protons will be chemically equivalent to each other, and we know, for instance, that these three tert-butyl proton uh, sets of methyl protons as part of the tert-butyl group are all going to be chemically equivalent to each other. These two isopropyl groups these are actually related by a reflection, a plane of uh, reflection symmetry of the molecule. And so these are chemically equivalent to each other. And the CH2 hydrogens will be chemically equivalent to each other. No stereocenters in this molecule. So these hydrogens are enantiotopic with respect to each other, as are these. So we can go ahead and color these in. Here's our equivalent isopropyl protons. Here's our lone equivalent methine proton, two sets of equivalent methylene protons, and the tert-butyl protons, all of which are equivalent to each other. All right, now let's talk about the multiplicity situation, starting with the red signal corresponding to these six isopropyl protons. These six protons have a neighboring carbon that bears one proton. That one proton will split the signal for these red hydrogens into a doublet. One neighbor, one plus one is two, multiplicity is two, we'd expect a doublet. Now, the orange hydrogen has six neighbors. All six of these protons have spins that will influence the signal for this H. So this is going to be split into a septet. Six neighbors plus one equals seven. Notice also that this hydrogen doesn't have any neighbors on this side. No implied hydrogens at the carbonyl carbon there. Moving to the other side of the CO double bond, these green hydrogens have two neighbors, two equivalent neighbors. Those two equivalent neighbors will split the signal for the green hydrogens into two plus one equals three subpeaks, corresponding to a triplet. And actually, the same will happen for the blue hydrogens. Just did this a bit out of order. These two hydrogens have two equivalent neighbors. Two plus one is three. Those will be split into a triplet. And notice also that these have no neighbors on the other side since that carbon bears no hydrogens. 
finally, the tert-butyl hydrogens. These are all connected to a quaternary carbon with no hydrogens attached to it. They have no neighbors. And so these nine hydrogens will appear as a singlet. And in fact, this is quite diagnostic of the tert-butyl group. When you see a singlet that integrates to nine hydrogens in the alkyl region of the spectrum, this is very, very commonly due to tert-butyl CH3 hydrogens. This slide shows some common splitting patterns for recurring alkyl groups, things like the ethyl, isopropyl, and terp-butyl groups that show up quite frequently in organic compounds. And recognizing these splitting patterns and integrations, which are related, as we'll see in a second, can help you become more efficient when analyzing proton NMR spectra. And integrations and splitting patterns often go hand in hand. They're often related to each other thanks to the N plus one rule. If I see a signal that integrates to N hydrogens, for example, I have N HAs, and those HAs couple to an HB, well, the multiplicity of HB will be N plus one, thanks to the N plus one rule. So quite frequently, the numbers of subpeaks in the integrations are related. For example, in the ethyl group, we've got a signal that integrates to two, and we've got another signal with three subpeaks. Two plus one equals three. A good sign that these two hydrogens are coupled to the hydrogens associated with this signal. Likewise, if we look at the integration here, we've got three hydrogens here, and sure enough, four subpeaks, three plus one, in the other signals. So these two signals are absolutely coupled to each other, and we, and this points to an, an ethyl group in particular, an ethyl group connected to something with no hydrogens here, since these two H's are coupled only to this CH3. Quite frequently, the CH2 will be deshielded or downfield relative to the CH3 because this might be connected to an electronegative atom like oxygen or nitrogen right here, leading to deshielding via an inductive effect. The isopropyl group, likewise, has a signal that integrates to one that is a septet, and that septet, seven subpeaks, come from the neighboring six hydrogens, which we see in this integration, and notice that, that signal for the six hydrogens is split into a doublet. That doublet comes from this hydrogen splitting these blue hydrogens in the isopropyl group. And finally, the tert-butyl group we already noted, no coupling whatsoever because that carbon at the center has no hydrogens. So the nine hydrogens in the tert-butyl group appear as a singlet. And again, when you see nine hydrogens in the alkyl region of the spectrum, this is quite frequently due to a tert-butyl group.